Alderman, can you hear us? Councilman, can you hear us? Right there. Councilman, can you hear us? Councilman Isbrand? Good afternoon. Can you hear us, sir? I can. Thank you. I'm working off a iPad for the moment because for some reason I'm having trouble connecting on another device, but I'm with you. <clears throat> it seems to be a, a running problem. We're just waiting for Mr. Gregory. Gregory. Mr. Isbrand, we show you on three devices. Which one are you going to be using to uh, speak on? Mr. Isbrand, are you with us? You might have uh, the mute on your device. 
Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, so you're using the iPad. Just wanted to make sure that way I know which one to unmute. Actually, you, you know what? I'm going to log off and log back on. There's something that's not working right here. Okay, sir. Mr. Schnall, can you hear us? Yes, sir. Perfect. Okay, well, we have a quorum. We're going to go ahead and get started while Mr. Isbrand uh, gets everything settled on his end. We're going to call the Castle Hill Special City Council meeting to order and determine. It's already recording. Uh, determine the Castle Hills City Council meeting to order and determine if a quorum is present. A quorum is present. We also have Mr. Isbrand joining us uh, via Zoom. We will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Mr. Gregory, will you lead us? Thank you, sir. Uh, I don't believe we have any citizens to be heard. Let me just check my email to confirm. Okay, we will proceed to the first item on the agenda, which is a public hearing on the proposed amendments to the zoning ordinance in chapter 50 of the code of ordinances. It is 602 and we'll be opening the public hearing. Okay, it is 6.03. We'll be closing the public hearing and moving on to item number two. Uh, discussion and possible action on ordinance 2020-06-24 in regard to amendments to various sections of the city zoning ordinance and providing a penalty for violations of the city zoning ordinance by a fine in accordance with ch section 1-17 of chapter one of the code of ordinances or by court action to prevent, restrain, correct, or abate violations with each day an offense occurs being a separate violation. Mr. Rapley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Schnall uh, and uh, Councilman Isbrand, can you see the screen with the PowerPoint? Okay. I can. Councilman Isbrand, can you see it? I do not. Okay. Well, we'll run through the presentation. Um, I know you do have a copy of it, sir. Uh, as I started to begin last week when we, um, before we had some technical difficulties about this presentation, uh, between myself and Mr. Schnall would be taking on um, the uh, presentation. And so uh, I was going to go through each slide and get as far as we can tonight and then try to do a part two. Uh, at another meeting, hopefully next week. Uh, and then as I go through each slide, I'll ask if Mr. Schnall has anything to address since he has the more historical um, as far as how we got to a zoning review committee and then um, through the last two zoning meetings itself. So as far as a background, uh, a zoning review committee was appointed in September 2015. A zoning review committee was appointed in 2015, September 2015. The committee was charged with not only review of the entire zoning ordinance, but also with the task 
of considering several areas specifically identified by then the city manager, including solar energy facilities, mixed use zoning, un uh, planned unit developments and home occupations. The proposed revisions recommended by the zoning review committee were presented to the then city manager in 2016. Previous and current zoning commissions have made additional amendments to date. Mr. Schnall. Um. Uh, that's that's correct. I can provide more detail on that, but I think in the interest of time, um, since the Zoning Commission has gone through all of the recommendations from the View Committee, it would be appropriate just to move on unless there are questions from members of the governing body. Okay, we'll proceed. Uh, further background, the last two Zoning Commissions have done a considerable amount of work, which includes updates to home occupation and an extensive amount of research on what other cities have done to allow and regulate short-term rentals in other communities. Current zoning commission recommended moving forward with the current language in chapter 50, including to allow short-term rentals in the community. The short-term language has been captured in sections 50-516 through 50-524. Some of the definitions that were presented um, over the course, uh, assisted living, housing, living arrangements for the elderly, infirm or disabled in which housekeeping meals Medical care and other assistance is available for residents as needed. Uh, child care center means a facility license certified or registered by the Department of Family and Protective Services to provide assessment, care, training, education, custody, treatment, or supervision for a child who is not related by blood, marriage, or adoption to the owner or operator of the facility for all part of the 24-day, whether or not the facility is operated for profit or changes for the services it offers. Uh, continuing care facility, a facility which offers tiered approach to the aging process, accommodation, residences, changing, changing needs with part independent living, part assisted living, and part skilled nursing home. Community home means a facility prescribed in Chapter 123 of the Texas Human uh, Resources Code and all promulgations thereof. Uh, daycare center, a child care facility that provides care at a location other than the residence of the director, owner, operator of the child care facility for seven or more children under 14 of, uh, years of age for less than 24 hours a day, but at least two hours a day, uh, two, to two hours a day, three or more days of the week under the Texas Human Resource Code 42.002. Guest house means living quarters with detached accessory building located on the same premise with the main building for the uh, for the use by temporary guests, six consecutive months or less of the occupants of the premises having kitchen and bathroom facilities and not rented or otherwise used as separate dwelling. Other common names are mother, law house, pool house, et cetera. Any questions, council? Yes, sir, Ms. Gregory. Continuing care facility. What is a tiered approach? Mr. Schnell, a tiered I'm, approach. Where, where is he? I, I can barely hear Mr. Gregory and I'm trying to find where is the language oh. he's referring Under the to. the definition of continuing care facility, section one. Ah, okay. Um, Mr. Gregory, I, that's the kind of facility that, that would offer different levels of care depending on the patient's condition. Um, some people would move into that facility and live in the independent living section um, if their health did not permit them to um, continue an independent living. They might move into an assisted living section of that um, facility. And then if, if that still was not uh, providing all the care they needed, they would go into a skilled nursing home. So the, there are facilities like this. I know at least one in another community um, that, that is exactly like that. Um, um, and I think that's what they mean when, that, when they say tiered approach, so that they have a tier for independent living, a tier for assisted living, and then an, a tier for the skilled nursing home. Thank you. Councilman Nisbrand, did you have any questions? I do not, thank you. Okay, council, Mr. Gregory, was that? Okay. 
Okay, under requirements applicable to all districts, Article 2, Division 1, Section 50-36, amend subsections. Under A, minimum parking for churches, B, vehicular driveway approaches, C, vehicular area surfacing, D, screening devices, E, general parking requirements, computation of spaces of mark, uh, marking of lots, spaces, fire lines, and crosswalks, F, accessory buildings, structures and uses, uh, parentheses, A, B, S, U's, uh, definition use, placement, amounts of structure, setbacks. Uh, general lighting standards provide minimum glare provisions and reduction of light emissions. Council, any questions? Okay. I have a, I have a oh. question about some of the definitions. Um, Mr. Rapley, do you prefer to just to go through your explanation of the whole thing and we ask questions at the end, or do you want to ask questions section by section? Um, it doesn't matter to me. If, if Mr. Schnall, would you want me to just go through the whole presentation and then come back with questions? Um, it's whatever the council wants, Mr. Rapley. Um, you know, we can certainly try and address questions as they come up. Um, I, I do have a slight problem, and it partially may be the volume on my uh, laptop. Um, and with the screen controlled by Mr. Zamarone, um, I can't really adjust the sound level on my laptop right now. Um, but I, I'm comfortable with, with the council having um, you uh, with my you know, input go through the whole PowerPoint and then um, uh, ask questions. I just think it might be easier for the governing body um, to ask questions as they see an issue or they have a question just like Mr. Gregory's question a few minutes ago. Um, it, it seems to me that's the, the best way and easiest for the council is if they, you know, we get to a part where they'd like to ask a question, um, that they ask it right then and there. Okay, we, Mr. Schnall. get through it all before we have to adjourn, then we just pick up there um, at, at the next meeting. So, Councilman Joyce, I can run through it if you'd like, and then we'd come back for the questions if you, if you wish. Okay, isn't that the opposite of what Mr. Schnall just said? <laughs> oh, yes, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm... Okay, okay. Um, Thanks. With respect to some of the, the definitions, uh, this new Texas law that was passed last year in September, Texas Government Code 3000.002, it's known as now, which basically tells us and all governing bodies like us that we can't determine what materials are used in our homes or buildings here in Castle Hills, nor can we determine a percentage of a certain material that can or can't be used. So given that, it makes me wonder why we need even to define, for example, brick material or a cementitious fiberboard or somewhere later down is I think a definition of masonry. Uh, shouldn't, I mean, basically, isn't that whole paragraph gonna go away? Because we're not allowed to specify certain materials. So why do we need to define them if we can't uh, have them? I believe so, uh, Mr. Schnall, I, and this is the one when the new state law that changed. Right. Yes, I, I think I heard that. I heard I heard the councilman's comments. Um, the change we made um, in 50-65 and then in in a few other places uh, make specific reference to um, material permitted pursuant to Chapter 3000 of the Texas Government Code um, uh, as a result of House Bill 3167. Um, uh, we we have to allow a, uh, a construction material, um, as the councilman noted, um, that meets the um, requirements of state law. And state law now says that if a building material is permitted by a national uh, building code within the last three code cycles, we need to allow a uh, a, a property owner or a builder to use that material. Um, however, leaving the definition of masonry and brick may still be useful um, in the event we do get a situation where someone wants to try and use something that they think is masonry is not covered in a nationally accepted building code within the last three code cycles. And and we're therefore leaving in this definition of masonry um, under that circumstance. 
it, it also is a way to let folks know that although we are going to permit any building material permitted under chapter 3000, um, this community for many, many years had the requirement of a percent of masonry, um, the 75% masonry. And, and that may be something that would be instructive to folks and perhaps could lead them to use, you know, a more traditional masonry product that would uh, be more in sync with the uh, housing, already existing housing stock in the community. Um, having said all that, uh, it, if, if it is the councilman's recommendation that we strip out the definitions of masonry and brick, um, we will strike them out. Well, thank you, Mr. Schnell. I appreciate that uh, explanation. And uh, maybe this is a minor point, I don't know, but it just seems to me to be superfluous. Um, you know, it, it doesn't matter what the material is because if it's in the last three versions of a particular building code, whatever it's called, it can be used. And I respect- uh, Agreed, your, thank I you, legislature. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's the other thing about this. It seems like you can't have an upscale community anymore, at least with respect to building materials. Um, but in any, in, in any event, um, uh, thank that's you. right. And it, it strips away from local governments um, some, some important things that have historically been used um, uh, to, you know, have communities maintain their appearance and character. Um, you know, I attended a seminar in, in April where there was a, a 30 or 40 minute presentation just on this statute. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the commentators, you know, were generally um, uncomfortable with the new regime, but it's the new regime we have to, you know, live with. Well, thank you again for that. And I respect your comments about the, the historical nature of leaving some of these things in. So I, I I accept your uh, recommendation. Thank you. Mr. Paul. Mr. Snow, it seems to me that if we leave it in there, it's a good backdrop, like you said, in case they try to bring something forward that in fact is not part of the uh, Section 300. It, and so my recommendation would be leave it in there. Am I off base or what is your thought? I, I don't, Mr. Mr. Paul, I don't see any any problem with leaving those definitions in, provided that we do leave in or add in the redlined, underlined new text um, in 5065 and in a few other sections, um, so that we have clearly, you know, are, are clearly in compliance with state law. We're right. we, we need to be in compliance with state law, but at the same time, um, use this in perhaps a subtle way. Um, to you know, put masonry in the front row, in in, in front of people, um, in the hopes that you know we, we won't have the uh, any of the negative impact of, of of certain building materials which don't have the level of of uh, attractiveness that masonry and brick might have. Thank you, Mr. Snow, Mr. Rapley. Okay, I'll continue. Uh, article three, um, excuse me, number three, um, uh, article uh, two, division two, uh, 50-61 adds telecommunication to the uh, is subsection, uh, 50-64 replaces motor cars to automobiles, strikes the sentence making this sub subsection applicable to uh, AA single family district zone, 50-65 specifies materials permitted for in the, uh, excuse me, for use in the district pursuant to chapter um, 3000 of the Texas government code and adds the phrase, uh, unless permitted by applicable state law. 50-67 uh, strikes, no vehicle whatsoever shall be parked beyond eight hours on a city owned unimproved right away at any time. Division four, AAA town, uh, townhouse district 50-134 uh, specifies materials permitted for use in the district 
pursuant to chapter 2000 of the Texas government code and adds a phrase, unless permitted by applicable state law. I think that's supposed to be chapter 30. Council, any questions? Mr. Gregory. Why was it in the struck, no vehicles whatsoever shall be parked beyond eight hours on city owned unimproved right of way at any time? Is that covered elsewhere? Is that why it was struck? Uh, Mr. Gregory, I believe that's the case. I believe it was the zoning commission, the zoning review committee sense and the zoning commission's agreement um, that um, the parking restrictions ought to be in the traffic or parking code um, and not in the zoning code. Um, I have not looked, um, I, I will admit, I probably have not looked at this since the zoning review committee looked at it in 2015 or 2016, but um, I'm, I'm comfortable that your supposition is exactly what we thought as well, that this uh, was in the uh, parking ordinance already. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Paul, did you have a question? Sorry. Mr. Paul, can you use your microphone? Sorry. Mr. Rapley. Um, article two continued. Um, Division eight, um, one story office professional district. Changes include removal of certain language in section 50 254, 50 255, and several subsections of 50 257. Division nine, two-story office professional district changes include removal of certain language in sections 50-284, 50-285, 50-287, and 50-288. Uh, FF office uh, condominium district changes include remo removal of certain languages in section 50-312. And then uh, under division 12, H special business district adds section 50-5, uh, excuse me, 50-390 utility service items. And um, Mr. Rapley, if I might just comment, uh, the changes in the E, F, and FF district um, were, were basically because the original zoning ordinance um, had what, what is sometimes called progressive zoning, where uh, even in the two-story office district, two-story office professional district, District F, there was originally language that allowed that to be used as a residence. And um, the, the changes that, that are reflected in the red line are to eliminate the references, uh, primarily are to eliminate the references to the use of the property um, as residences. Um, um, that, that's, for example, in 50-254, um, uh, the, the change was to take out a sentence that said any use allowed in the B district. Well, the B district's a residential district. So we struck that. And then there were some changes that needed to be made um, in building area, that's section 250-255. So those were the kinds of changes um, that were made um, in the E district. Um, and similar changes were made in the F and double F district. Um, um, there was also a change, uh, the change in 50-284 um, uh, and in 50-312 um, uh, um, also um, uh, expanded on the um, hazards or the, the nuisance risks that uh, might come from you know, office type use. Um, so new language, uh, the, the existing language was changed to read no adverse effect on adjacent or neighborhood properties by reason of dust, odor, vibration, noise, or hiding, or, or lighting shall be created. Um, and that there shall be only one principal structure on any lot. So you can't have a, 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 um, a office building where there are multiple buildings on the same lot. Um, and those are, that's, that kind of summarizes what those changes were and, um, uh, why they were made. Okay, Mr. Ampley. Thank you, Mr. Snow. Um, Mr. Gregory. Mr. Snow, I believe there is one building here in the city in which it's a 
office building, but it's used, there's also living quarters on the second floor. Are they grandfathered out of this? Or must they, they are grandfathered out of this. Um, if, if that residential use, however, is abandoned for the requisite amount of time, um, then um, that property would need to be only used um, as the office. Thank you. But, but an existing use that was legal or permitted when it was established, it can continue even with these changes. Mr. Joyce? Yes, I have a comment that um, is not related to the changes with respect to the amount of parking required in uh, D and F. Um, and I think probably the appropriate thing to do would be to talk to the zoning commission, but it seems to me that, for example, on page 30, where you're dealing at section on parking space, section F2, um, where there's sort of a gradation of required parking depending on the size of the office building. Um, one space for 200 square feet is a, is a lot of parking. And uh, what that boils down to is roughly five spaces per thousand square feet. And it's really hard to achieve that. So uh, one to 300, which is for 20, for buildings of 20,000 square feet or larger is more standard. And actually that's San Antonio's code across the board. So if y'all don't object, I will invite the zoning guys to just look into that. Uh, Mr. Joyce. Sir. Um, as a member of the governing body, you have the opportunity, if you wish, to simply at the point in time when this ordinance is going to be acted upon to um, make an amendment to modify this parking requirement to simply be what you think is best based on your comment and professional experience. Um, uh, this was not something that was really discussed by the review committee. Um, we didn't have anyone um, who was a professional architect um, on the review committee. Um, and um, if the standard right now is one parking space for 300 square feet for an office, um, it, it's an opportunity to simply make this change without it going back to the zoning commission um, if that's you know what you'd like to see happen, and we can do that, um, you know, Mr. Rapley and I can work up where a change like like that might be made. Okay, well, I appreciate that comment, Mr. Schnall. Thank you. And actually, there is another area with respect to parking, but actually, it's among those things you guys are proposing to change, and it has to do with the amount of parking in uh, drive-in restaurants. Uh, I received a comment from uh, Barry Middleman, who, as you know, is a kind of a renowned San Antonio architect and currently the chair of our architecture review committee, who suggested that we take down the amount of parking required for drive-in restaurants. And I can, um, yes, and I can uh, point to you specifically what he proposes. Um, that would be in section 50-351 subsection F that deals with drive-in eating establishments where he proposes instead of the way it reads now is two parking spaces for 100 square feet, uh, he proposes that there would be one parking spaces for 150 square feet. And by the way, that's the same, <coughs> excuse me, that's the same as what San Antonio requires at this time. Yes, uh, Mr. Joyce, I did get, Mr. Rapley did forward a copy of that email to me. Okay. And the, 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 my comment on that is exactly the same. If that is okay. what is um, recommended by the professionals who deal with this um, on a regular basis, um, it is something that we can um, accommodate um, uh, throughout. Um, making the change in, in 50-257F to make it one per 300 feet and in 50-351F making it one per 150 feet. Um, this code was originally adopted probably in the 1950s when there were probably 
more drive-in establishments becoming part of the suburban landscape. Um, right. There seem to be fewer and fewer of those kinds of establishments. We do have one drive-in restaurant um, on Northwest Military. Um, we may have one on um, uh, Jackson Keller. Um, I'm not sure how many others we'll have, but certainly if um, uh, this, the standard in, in, in the commu larger community which surrounds us and in your judgment is one per 150, um, you know, we can uh, incorporate that change um, in between now and the next meeting of the council, or it can be done um, through a, an a motion to amend the um, ordinance uh, at the time of adoption. And I've made a note of both of those, and I'll check on that uh, parking requirements um, also in the F and double F districts so we can be consistent. Very well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Snell. Uh, Mr. Rapley, he is dealing with an issue. Give me one second, Mr. Snell. at the door no one will let him in huh? okay okay um we'll go start here with 50-351 um though it appears this section is redlined the only change uh is k discuss minimum off street parking for general assembly halls general businesses personal service establishments food services and drive-in establishments, office and retail spaces, combination establishments, shopping center, education facilities, general offices, as well as clinics. Any questions on this council? Go question, ahead, sir. I'm sorry to be the stiff fly in the ointment here, but do we distinguish between a restaurant like Sonic and a restaurant like Burger King that has a drive-through where you drive in and around? With Sonic, you drive through, you drive in, and you stay there. Mr. Schnall? I think Sonic is a drive-in establishment and the Jack in the Box, um, for example, at the intersection of uh, Northwest Military and Lock Hill Selma is a drive-through. If, if you're going to drive in and park like at a Sonic, that's a drive-in. Okay. If you're gonna do a, a drive-through where you order at one station and then drive up and pay and pick up, um, Jack in the Box, McDonald's, Burger King, that's not a drive-in establishment. Okay, thanks. Mr. Rapley. Okay, under uh, section five, planned use development, 50-407 uses replaces with purpose. Uh, the new language, uh, the planned United Def uh, Development District PUD is a freestanding district designed to provide for the development of land as integral uh, unit for single or mixed uses in accordance with a plan that may vary from the established regulations of other zoning districts. Is the intent in such a district to ensure compliance with good zoning practices while allowing certain desirable departures from the strict provisions of specific zoning classifications? And if I may just interject, Mr. Rapley, um, uh, this is one of the, um, I would say the first of the three areas where the um, 
zoning review committee um, uh, was asked to specifically look at uh, certain things. When Mr. Rapley introduced this subject a, a few minutes ago, um, he noted that the charge to the review committee um, included some specifics that the former city manager had asked to be looked at and planned use developments were uh, one of those things where the city manager at the time, um, probably because of inquiries from developers or others, um, uh, recommended that, that the committee look at um, strengthening and making more detailed um, the whole planned use development or PUD uh, process in the city of Castle Hills. Um, the committee um, looked at several um, planned unit development ordinances from comparable communities. And the ordinance that we um, presented to the zoning commission and which is being presented here tonight uh, to the city council um, is based upon, not copied verbatim from, but based upon um, an ordinance in the city of Chavano Park where they had had uh, several years of experience um, in um, developing and implementing and living with their planned unit development um, or PUD district regulations. Um, if you've been to um, the, the Bentley Manor community in Chavano Park, um, uh, that was, that's probably a planned unit development. I didn't double check it, but it's probably a pod. Um, and as, as this language that Mr. Rapley just read and it's up on my screen, um, it really is a district that, that where we can combine uh, compliance with good zoning practices um, while allowing um, a fair amount of flexibility um, to a developer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schnall. Uh, Mr. Rapley? Council, do you have any questions? For me? We'll continue with the PUD. 50-408 uh, application procedure discusses application process and procedures. 50-409 uh, specification of a base zoning district, initial base zoning controls, initial application. 50-410, two types of plans, discusses two types of PUD developments, general guidelines for use, and detailed. Uh, this goes into more detail of the PUD itself. 50-411, uh, conceptual plan requirements, discusses requirements for a concept plan. Two include relation to the comprehensive plan, acreage, survey, land uses, thoroughfare layout, development standards, and existing conditions. Any questions from council? Mr. Gregory? I have just one question that I don't know if it can be answered under 5409. The base zoning district shall be specified in the initial application and initial is set apart in script as opposed to the rest of the words. Why? Why was initial? Apparently it, this means something significant because they have it in a different font. Why is it? This way, Mr. Snell, can you help us with that? Um, this I will admit is the first time I noticed that the word initial is in italics, both in 50-408 and 50-409. Um, I hadn't noticed that before, um, but I I do think that um, the the when a piece of property is going to become a planned unit development it's going to be zoned planned unit development. Um, and I think that the idea was so that when the city staff and the zoning commission and the city council um, each incrementally review um, applications for planned unit development, um, that they understand what the starting point was you know, for this, this property, for example, we have a planned unit development um, off of West Avenue, um, just up the street um, from Antonian on the Antonian side of West Avenue. And that property was probably a single family residence, a district zoning. And it just would be, we thought helpful to staff and to our commission um, for, 
for it to be clearly identified by the applicant. Um, if this district doesn't become a pod, it's zoned A or it's zoned double A or it's zoned something else. Um, I, I'm not sure there wasn't any, any other significance to the fact that the word initial is in italics. Thank you. And we can un, un italicize it if there's uh, a request to do so. Thank you, Mr. Snow. Mr. Rapley. As we continue under the PUD, 50-412, uh, uh, detailed plan requirements discusses requirements for a detailed plan to include uh, acreage, land uses, offsite information, traffic and transportation, buildings, uh, residential development, water and drainage utilities, open space, sidewalks uh, and bike paths, landscape plan and lighting. Under 50-413, action on concept plan, City Council may, after receiving a report or recommendation, report or recommendation from the Zoning Commission, act on a proposed concept plan. And then 50-414, action on the detailed plan, discusses the approval methodology for, the, uh, for approving the detailed plan. Any questions, Council? Go Mr. ahead, Gardner. sir. I, I have one question uh, regarding action. Is there any proviso offered here for the circumstance where a particular zoning commission doesn't take action? Yes, sir. Absolutely. And if you look at the wording of 50-413, it says council may, after receiving a recommendation or report from the zoning commission, act on a proposed concept plan. Um, that language is there because historically, and it's not redlined especially here because this is all brand new language in the PUD district, but at the end of Mr. Rapley's presentation, we're gonna circle back to two or three items um, that were raised during public hearings at prior meetings of this, of this council in December of last year and January, February, March of this year, as well as comments that I just saw for the first time this afternoon, um, submitted to Mr. Rapley by Mr. McCormick. Um, the reason the, the absence of a recommendation can still permit council action is by use of the words or report. Interestingly, although historically in the city of Castle Hills, and this goes back to the first zoning commission I attended as a alternate to the zoning commission in 1986 or 87. Our ordinances just said recommendation. When you look carefully at the local government code, chapter 211, section 211.007, the language reads that a zoning commission shall make a preliminary report and a report and a final report to the governing body. The statute does not use the word recommendation, it uses the word report. So in this comprehensive update, and 50-413 is a good example of it, we have not removed the word recommendation, but we have made a report an alternate. So if a zoning commission simply declines to make a recommendation, it would still be making a report and its report could and will be in the form of minutes of its meetings. And so that way we, we eliminate the uh, delay um, and, and, and perhaps the uncertainty of the non-action by a zoning commission and prevent that non-action from basically hamstringing the governing body. Um, you know, it shouldn't happen, but it can happen. Um, and you know, I felt in, in consultation with um, the council who um, we were working with in regard to the a lawsuit brought by the Wayside Chapel, um, 
that we should in this comprehensive revision um, incorporate the language that um, a zoning commission should be giving a report or a report or a recommendation, but not leave it just as a recommendation. And in various sections, um, uh, the same kind of modification is redlined because it is new language. In this section, it didn't happen to be redlined because the whole section, uh, the whole section on planned unit developments was completely rewritten. That's why um, I'm looking at a hard copy of page 43. Everything is underlined because everything um, on page 43 is new language that comes from the uh, Zoning Review Committee and the Zoning Commission. So, Mr. May, I hope that's responsive. Thank you for that history. That's helpful. Mr. Gregory. Mark, in accordance with that, does it require a different vote if it's a report versus a recommendation? Does a supermajority come into play one time and a simple majority come into play another? Well, the Zoning Commission doesn't generally act by supermajority. It's only the governing body right. which has to act by certain by a supermajority under certain circumstances. Um, so whether it's a report or a recommendation from the Zoning Commission um, doesn't affect um, that language. So a supermajority, I've always understood to overturn the Zoning Commission, their recommendation to overturn a recommendation requires a supermajority. But Not was, exactly. No. A Zoning Commission recommendation to deny a zoning change requires a supermajority vote by the governing body. A zoning commission recommendation to approve only needs a simple majority of the governing body. Thank you. Mr. Joyce. Quick question. Um, from a logistics standpoint, um, I understand that the report could constitute the minutes or vice versa. Um, Sometimes the council meetings are just a week or so behind the zoning meetings. Do we have the capability of turning around those minutes in a week so that in the event that the commission has not taken action, the council has the minutes? I don't see that as an issue. Typically with our interim city secretary, she's been turning around pretty quick, but if this is the case, we can, we can do that. Okay. The stipulation is in there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Joyce. Mr. Rapley. Thank you, Mayor. I'll continue. We'll continue with the PUD. PUD. 50 415 amendments discusses changes in both the general and the detailed plan and time limit considerations. Uh, 50 416 criteria for approval sets forth criteria the Zoning Commission and the city council should consider when making a final action decision. Section 417, time limit. This section set forth time limits or life of concept and detailed plans. And then section 418, minimum development size discusses uh, minimum lot size. Council. questions okay. uh, we'll continue into home occupations okay. uh, mr rapley excuse me for just a minute let me go ahead and, and just introduce this real quickly um, sure. home occupations another one of the sections that the former city manager asked the zoning review committee to study and make specific um, recommendations to um, it was the subject of several pretty long discussions at meetings of the Zoning Review Committee um, and then went to the Zoning Commission and was um, substantially changed um, by the Zoning Commission um, to make it um, clearer and more specific um, uh, e than even the Review Committee had, had recommended. Um, and um, uh, as part of that effort, um, uh, you know, Mr. Rapley asked me to, um, you know, prepare the final wording 
um, for zoning commission approval. And I, I can't remember whether this was approved. I know this was discussed at least several meetings when Mr. Isbrand was chairman of the zoning commission, but I think the final approval may have come um, after he was no longer the chair of the zoning commission. But this was another section that did have um, a considerable discussion um, by both the review committee um, and the uh, zoning commission. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stone. Mr. Rapley. Okay, 50-427 uh, discusses, discusses in which districts a home occupation can incur. 50-427 sets forth detailed specific conditions of use of for home occupations. And then 50-429 discusses legal non-conforming use and existence upon adoption of this code. Any questions, council? Okay. Alternative uh, energy provisions, 50-470A discusses the purposes of the regulation. 50-470B discusses general standards and specifics building and freestanding systems, electrical requirements, and the requirements for an SUP with any system. Under sexually oriented businesses, 50-486, compliance with state regulations. These type of businesses must comply with Texas local government code, which are adopted by reference. Mr. Paul, excuse your microphone. Mr. Snow, there's an awful lot of references in our zoning code dealing with sexual explicit situations, organizations, uh, companies, whatever, nudity, the whole bit. Is this so that we can say, no, we don't want this and identify it as the, what we don't want? Or can we have a, a, I don't know that part of that zoning. Do we have an ordinance that says we have to have those type of businesses? State law and federal law, basically, and, and I'm, I am kind of grossly summarizing, okay. um, say that uh, because of the First Amendment to both the US Constitution and the Texas Constitution about freedom of expression, that a city cannot have a zoning structure that makes it impossible for there to be any sexually oriented business within the city limits. Cities can, however, regulate, define, define and regulate sexually oriented businesses. So long as on the official city map, someone like the city manager can look at the map and point to one area in the city where the area or distance or other regulations would allow the existence of a sexually oriented business. The only change that the Zoning Review Committee and Zoning Commission are recommending to this um, portion of the ordinance is the last section, the one that's on the screen now, that says that uses must comply with the provisions in the Texas Local Government Code because there is a specific chapter, I don't have that code in front of me right now, but there's a specific chapter in the local government code that has additional state regulations and state limitations on these kinds of businesses. You know, obviously, it's not the kind of thing where most any of us would want to live next door or down the street, but um, state and federal law require there to be at least some place within the city limits where these kinds of businesses can legally um, open and exist. Um, I don't believe we have any in our city limits now. I'm not an expert on this, but um, I think that if we had one in our city limits, Mr. Rapley would be regularly hearing from people about it. Um, and, and, and that's the reason we, we have the 
language in the code. Um, this language has been in the code um, uh, since at least 1955, 1995, um, and, and may have been in there um, even before that. Um, and it's um, chapter 243 of the local government code um, is, the, um, is the state regulation. Um, so I think we, you know, we do need to have this language and we need, need to have um, the definitions that are related to, um, for lack of a better summary word, sexuality, um, so that we can effectively regulate um, these kinds of businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Snell. Mr. Rapley? And under special use permits, under 50-498, uh, this gives the city manager the authority to reject an application failing to include all requirements in this section. 50-499 requires the city manager to submit the application and report to the zoning commission. Uh, Division two, section 50-514E gives city manager latitude to determine to which trees a measurement standard is applied other than um, trees specified in the same section. And then 50-514H is struck because it is moved to district regulations for the G and H districts. Okay, and if, if we can just circle back under um, special use permits, um, uh, as, as y'all may recall, and I guess this is before um, uh, Mr. Paul returned to council and Mr. Joyce was elected to council, um, uh, the council in, um, I believe, March of this year um, did amend 50-497 to address a uh, constitutional issue raised by Wayside Chapel. That change is incorporated in the document um, that um, you have on page 51. Um, and um, again, you'll see in 50-499, um, you'll see again, to come back to the, the question Mr. May asked a few minutes ago, 50-499, um, uh, commission recommendation or report to city council. Um, and um, again, in 50-50, um, idea being that you know, we, we, we believe the, sp the special use permit provisions um, provide a level of protection uh, to the community um, in terms of what someone can do um, that's not automatically permissible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Snow. Mr. Rapley. Uh, Short-term rentals. Uh, this, this section here discusses, which again, as Mr. Schnall can elaborate, this is a brand new section, discusses the purpose of this article, 50-516. 50-517 specifies definitions using the article. 5018 sets requirements for a short-term rental permit. 50-519 discusses registration fee, uh, content of the application for permit and inspection requirements prior to the issuance of a permit. And then 50-520 sets forth detailed operational requirements, including uh, details that address nu uh, nuisances, maximum occupancy loads, and the requirement for the local contact person to be immediately available for uh, assistance. Go ahead, sir. Councilman Green. It's been a long time since I took property, so I can't remember the answer to this question. On 50-517E, the person or entity that holds legal or equitable title. I forget what that means. What is equitable title? Mr. Snow? I'm, I'm just looking for where the language is again. 50-517E. Uh, Under owner. Okay. Owner. Um, the, it's, it's a a term we don't usually hear a whole lot. Um, legal title means you have a deed, a recorded warranty deed or recorded special warranty deed that identifies you as the owner. However, um, in some parts of Bear County, 
and in other parts of the state of Texas, there are real estate transactions called contracts for deed. So if I own, Mr. Mayo liked this example, it'll remind him of law school. If I own Black Acre and I want to sell Black Acre to Mr. Rapley, but he can't pay me for it, he just needs to make monthly payments. And I want to make sure that I'm going to continue to own it until he pays me the whole purchase price. I would agree, assuming I liked Mr. Rapley, to sell Mr. Rapley Black Acre on a contract for deed. Once that contract for deed is signed, Mr. Rapley becomes an equitable owner of Black Acre. I'm still the legal owner because all he has is a contract to buy the property. And that's probably the best and shortest explanation I can give. And Mr. May, will you give me an A for that? <laughs> Mr. Schnall, I certainly do. I only know one thing about that matter. And my property law professor said, never do that kind of sale for deed. And I have said that to so many clients over the years. You, do, you don't wanna be a buyer of that kind of a deal. And under, under the new re regime of state law adopted about four or five, six years ago, you really don't wanna be a seller either. Um, but that's equitable title, Mr. Gregory. Um, Should we uh, have I think it that's, in our code? That's probably the best example I could give. Should we have it in our code, equitable no, title? I mean, should we, you know, the, the whole concept of short-term rental and, 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 and this comment really applies to the whole section. It's about what, what should a, a city do in regard to interfering with or, or, or addressing the rights of a property owner to do what he or she wishes to do with their property. Um, the Zoning Review Committee, because at the time the Zoning Review Committee looked at this, the city was experiencing horrible nuisance, nuisances with short-term rental properties. The Zoning Review Committee recommended prohibiting short-term rentals of property in the residential districts. That problem was alleviated by the elimination of one specific nuisance that done independently, plus the adoption of a uh, stringent uh, amendment to the nuisance ordinance, giving more authority, more teeth to city staff and to the city municipal court in dealing with um, egregious conduct. The overall concept though, should we permit someone who owns a piece of property on an, on an equitable basis versus a legal basis? Um, it seems to me that um, if we're gonna allow short-term rentals, it doesn't really matter whether the landlord holds legal title or holds equitable title. That's a matter of private, arrangement between the short-term rental landlord and the short-term rental tenant, um, the short-term rental occupant. Um, I, I just don't see any reason to take it out. If, if the council is uncomfortable with it, we'll take it out. Well, who do we go, who do we go after if there's a problem, the equitable owner or the property owner? Well, we're gonna have, as you'll see, as Mr. Rapley perhaps goes into a little bit more detail. There is a registration form and that registration form provides information to the city and the city will go after the person who has registered the property and who has identified his, his or her ownership interest. So um, I don't think it's right to go after the legal title owner if the short-term rental is being operated by the equitable owner. And I don't think it's appropriate to go after the equitable owner for some reason, the legal owner is the one who's doing the, um, the short-term rental business. Um, this really boils down to um, the question of permitting short-term rentals. And if they're permitted to address appropriate regulation, um, when we get to it, there is one section in here that since this was, since this came out of the um, uh, 
the zoning commission, um, uh, there is a, a pretty clear indication that there is one provision in here that would probably not withstand a challenge on constitutionality basis. And, and I do wanna point that out when we get to it. Um, Mr. Gregory. If, if the equitable owner is a limited partnership or an LLC, uh, does that cause any difficulty for the city to go after the, the this limited partnership or LLC? Um, probably not, Mr. Gregory, because the there is still an asset that the limited partnership or limited liability company owns, the real estate. So that if uh, the city were to take action um, that involved a fee or a fine that wasn't being paid, um, the city could look at um, enforcing that lien or, or that fine or fee um, through some kind of a filing. Um, most likely, violations of the short-term rental restrictions would probably result in pulling the permit and then if the person continued to operate after the permit was, was pulled, um, that would then go to the municipal court. Um, and um, once the municipal court you know, issues a fine or a penalty, um, if it's not paid, there's a procedure to deal with that, um, uh, that um, most cities have contracted out to a, a collection law firm. Um, but again, it's, it's a matter of whether you can treat a, a property owner who is an individual different from a property owner who is a limited liability company. And I, I just don't think that, um, that you can really appropriately do that in the short-term rental ordinance. Um, uh, there are a number of reasons, liability protection being at the top of the list why owners of rental property would want it to be held in an entity like an LLC. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Snow. And Mark, that section is 50-524 under permit suspension or revoke, uh, ah, okay. revoking appeal. So it does go to municipal court judge, suspend or revoke any short-term permit issued for the same short-term rental where the violation occurs and there's a process if your uh, permit is revoked by the city as a short-term operator. Okay. Um, and Mr. Rapley, since I just now found it, I'd like to, if I don't, if you don't mind, um, ask the council to look on page 58 under section 50-520, which is titled short-term rental operational requirements. And it's sub eight under uh, 50-520 where there is a um, federal court decision which declared um, unconstitutional as a violation of the right of assembly uh, to prohibit a uh, short-term rental property from being the site of a wedding or a party. Um, and um, I, I express that statement to the council. Um, we can leave this in. If it's never challenged, it's never challenged. However, if it is challenged, um, unless there are, are overriding decisions um, uh, by courts, um, I'm gonna have to tell you that um, uh, we may have a problem enforcing it. The fact that ours does allow those kinds of functions in the G or H zoning district is why I left it in. I felt that I, there was an opportunity to differentiate the blanket prohibition by simply prohibiting that um, in the residential districts. Um, because functions like weddings and, and large gatherings um, you know, are more appropriately done at party centers or 
hotels, uh, banquet halls, and not done in someone's front yard um, or in someone's living room. And I thought that we might be able to skate by this right of assembly issue by saying that um, we are going to permit these uses in a short-term rental if it's located in our business districts. Um, but I, I don't want the council to assume that we'll be able to enforce that subsection eight um, if it's challenged on constitutional grounds. Thank you, Mr. Snow. Mr. Rapley. The Zoning Commission, section 50-619 added um, in parentheses of re or report in two places. 50-622 sets a minimum time between reapplication for rezoning hearing if the previous rezoning application was denied by city council within the last six months. 50-623 allows an applicant one postponement of a zoning hearing for each body, the zoning commission and the city council. Um, and um, the, the other important change, and it didn't happen to make it to Mr. Rapley's PowerPoint, um, is if the council will refer to sec page 65, section 50-616. Um, the addition of the words, the district regulations of, are a function again of a uh, careful reading of chapter 211 of the local government code um, that would, if this language had been in our ordinance before now, and, or if it ever gets in, but, but as our ordinance currently reads, um, the reason that we had to go to the Zoning Commission for the rewrite of 50-497 to address the Wayside Chapel's constitutional challenge about SUPs was because our ordinance said that a textual provision of any kind had to go to the Zoning Commission for a recommendation. But the statute says that it's only changes to the textual provisions of the district regulations that go to the Zoning Commission. And the district regulations are the regulations for the zoning districts, A, AA, AAA, B, C, D, E, F, F, G, and H. Um, so again, that language is being recommended so that we have clarity um, and more importantly, consistency uh, with chapter 211 of the local government code. Um, I will say that the, um, the review committee did spend some time on that last change about postponements, um, trying to weigh the interests of the community as a whole, um, especially the residents who would be attending meetings um, and, and wanted to make sure their voices were heard at meetings um, against the, um, the concerns of an applicant. We didn't want an applicant to be able to con consistently get continuance after continuance, um, forcing people to come back month after month. Um, but at the same time, we you know, also wanted to get a give, give an applicant who needed at least one extension an opportunity to get an extension. We tried to balance um, the two sides that are sometimes um, present during um, uh, zoning disputes. Um, I, I, on behalf of Mr. Rapley um, I, and myself, I wanna thank everyone for your questions and your comments and most of all your attention. Um, uh, Mr. Gregory may not remember this, but I do. When I was chairman of the zoning commission and the last time there was this kind of comprehensive review of the zoning ordinance, it took us 45 minutes at three consecutive, 30 to 45 minutes at three consecutive council meetings to get through the uh, recommendations from the zoning review committee slash zoning commission. And we've done the whole thing 
in about an hour and 15 minutes. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Snow. Mr. Rapley? Uh, Councilman Joyce. Um, Mr. Snow, you had mentioned some uh, comments from Mr. McCormick. Ah, uh, thank a you. Or, a moment or two ago, I wonder thank if- you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, Mr. McCormick had three comments that I, um, oh, I, I'm gonna try and turn my volume up so I can hear you all better and I hope, I hope I'm not shouting. I'll try not to. Um, the three, the four comments from Mr. McCormick, one was about 50-07 or 50-7. I'm gonna turn to it and give you the page number for that. Um, it is on page, page 12 and the change Mr. McCormick is suggesting is really very similar to the change in front of you. Um, that comment I made about district reg regulations, that is incorporated not only um, at the end in the 600 cycle, it's also in 50-7, um, as well as a final report. Um, and it does has the sentence, and the sentence in section 50-7, hopefully y'all can read, Mr. McCormick's language, if I, if I took my notes correctly, um, where, where you see the red line on 50-7 on page 12, since beginning should there be, um, Mr. McCormick was suggesting language, before taking any such action, the city council shall request and consider the recommendation of the zoning commission. If the zoning commission fails to provide written recommendation by the end of 60 days following the date of the request, the Zoning Commission shall be presumed to have made no recommendation and the City Council may proceed and vote on that basis. Um, my concern about that language is that I don't know whether a court would um, enforce a presumption of this kind and that it doesn't negate the statement that there shall, that the council shall request and consider a recommendation of the zoning commission. Um, my sense is that I think we accomplish virtually the same thing Mr. McCormick recommends um, in the sentence that says, should there be no formal recommendation or report from the zoning commission within 60 days of it, the initial public hearing on such matter, the minutes of the zoning commission draft or approved shall stand as the final report. And that brings us to a question that I think was raised earlier in, in, in answer about um, you know, the timing of minutes of the zoning commission. Um, again, historically, um, the, the 10 or 12 or 15 years I was chairman of the zoning commission, we would have a meeting on the first Tuesday of the month. Um, within 48 hours after that meeting, the then city secretary would have um, sent me minutes of that meeting, which I would have, um, which I review, um, marked up any changes, sent back to the city secretary. Those changes were incorporated in and she had a signed copy of that set of minutes uh, that could be put in the city council packet by Friday afternoon. That was the normal drill. Uh, I don't think that's been happening recently um, but the concept is that um, even under this language, even the draft minutes of a zoning commission meeting would be sufficient to inform the city council about the zoning commission's um, vote and action. And um, I think that provides this um, expedited um, result that is ultimately, I think, what Mr. McCormick was looking for. Um, I, I want to thank Mr. McCormick. I don't see him on here, but I'd like to thank him. He prefaced his remark by noting correctly that many of the other recommendations he had made were things that, you know, were already incorporated into this ordinance um, that y'all have before you. Um, uh, Mr. McCormick made a suggestion um, in regard to 50-497 to um, modify the language. 50-497 um, is the section that was recently changed to deal with the wayside situation. It's on page 51 
of this ordinance. Um, and what Mr. McCormick is suggesting is a change to 50-497B um, and he would change that um, language entirely to simply say that um, the uses allowable in the A district are as set out in section 50-61. In all other districts, the following uses may be requested and leaves in general care hospitals and nursing homes. Um, I, I gave some thought to that change and um, I do not have a problem with that change. If the council would like that change incorporated in, um, we don't have to vote on it. Um, but if there is a consensus tonight, but if there is a consensus that that language be um, incorporated in, um, what I would suggest is that um, y'all give that indication to Mr. Rapley independently, and then we will um, incorporate that new language um, as well as the new language about parking um, that was discussed earlier this evening. The third comment Mr. McCormick made was to get 50-590 correct. And um, he must have been looking at a prior version of this ordinance because the ordinance that um, was attached to the packet um, has the language for 5590 that was adopted um, one or two meetings ago. So it is the latest language which called for, as you all did at the meeting earlier this month, uh, went around the, the dais and each member of the governing body appointed a person to the zoning commission, the mayor appointed a chair, and there was discussion and some action on alternates as well. That's new 50-590, it's in here. And the fourth recommendation for Mr. McCormick was a recommendation that he did make earlier uh, during Citizens to be Heard. Um, it was a recommendation that um, I felt was not appropriate to make. It was to delete the last sentence of 50-649. The last sentence of 50-649 uh, uh, says, proceedings before the committee, and this is about the zoning review committee, proceedings before the committee shall be in accordance with the provisions of the most recent edition of Robert's Rules of Order. And um, Mr. McCormick's concern that he expressed during the public hearing was that um, the um, uh, Robert's Rules of Order were, 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 was not written for governmental bodies. Um, and, and that's true. Robert's Rules of Order was really written for um, overall procedure for all kinds of meetings. Um, the city council um, last June um, canceled or rescinded or revoked uh, prior local rules of order and adopted Robert's rules of order um, to govern its proceedings. Um, the attorney general of Texas has stated both in its open meetings handbook and in at least two um, attorney general opinions, one by um, Governor Abbott when he was attorney general and one by um, Dan Morales when he was attorney general, uh, statements that uh, recognize that Robert's Rules of Order um, is something that is adopted um, by governmental bodies. Um, uh, under the circumstances, um, it was my view and remains my view that unless until the city council adopts new local rules, the use of Robert's Rules of Order latest edition, um, as long as in compliance with the Open Meetings Act, um, is the best uh, course of action. Um, Mr. Rapley um, and I have discussed um, working on um, local rules of order, um, patterned after a few samples that he is assembling um, and trying to simplify them 
um, for our community. We don't need uh, a, a hundred pages. We don't need 20 pages. We probably don't need the 600 pages of Robert's Rules, but Robert's Rules is the, um, the gold standard for, um, for meetings. Um, you know, I serve as a parliamentarian for um, at least one and probably more than one local nonprofit board. Um, and I take my Robert's Rules or I take excerpts from it um, when I attend meetings so that I can you know, help um, the procedural part of a meeting move forward. Um, if the council wants to take this out in, in regard to the zoning review committee, I don't think the world will shake. Um, but overall, uh, Robert's Rules provides um, steady guideposts that in the absence of having uh, local rules uh, seem to me to make sense to have something. Um, thank you, Mr. Joyce. Those were Mr. McCormick's um, four comments. Um, and, you know, as, as, as I've indicated on two of them, I think, you know, we've already done one of them. A second one, I think is easy to do. Um, the third one, the first one I mentioned, you know, I would commend to you um, the provision that's already in the red line as it seems to me to accomplish um, virtually what Mr. McCormick is recommending. Um, uh, but um, I, I'm glad that Mr. Joyce reminded me that we, we did need to do that. Um, uh, thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Snow. Mr. Paul. Can I make two comments? Uh, are are they, we at that point? I mean. Are they germane to the topic or is it an announcement? No, no, to the topics. <clears throat> There's two items. Uh, number one, I was concerned. I don't see anything that allows the city to control hostels. And I know that one, at least one that cropped up uh, a while back and those things, they're not short-term rentals and yet they can have 15, 20, 25 people if the house is big enough and uh, hostels are short-term overnight type of things for generally younger people. And uh, Mr. Snow, are you aware of anything that we have that allows us to control that? And if not, how could we approach that? We can't do that tonight, but I just think it needs to be addressed personally. Um, a couple of comments. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Um, and, and Mr. Rapley may be able to help on this too. I know the word hostile was used um, in the discussions by the Zoning Commission at various points when the short-term rental ordinance was being discussed. Um, and the definition in 50-517 on page 56, short-term rental, a privately owned dwelling, including but not limited to a single family dwelling, multiple family attached dwelling, apartment house, condominium, duplex, or any portion of such dwellings rented by the public for consideration and used for dwelling, lodging, or sleeping purposes for any period less than 30 consecutive days, but shall not include habitable accessory buildings. Um, it does exclude um, hotels and motels and private clubs and things like that. Um, but uh, Mr. Paul, if your suggestion is that we specifically um, regulate hostels by adding the word hostel to this definition of short-term rental, that is the shortcut we could use. I don't know that that would necessarily cover it, would it? If we just added the word to it, would that take care of it? I mean, it's a different type of clientele with different uh, circumstances. And this one I'm talking about, there's like 15, 12, 15 bunk beds upstairs, but then downstairs there's bedrooms that they use for short-term rental. And I mean, it's, 
I just don't think it's good for the neighbors, the neighborhood, and I don't think it's something that we should, if we could eliminate, allow. Well, I, you know, we can look and see whether the other portions of the short-term rental provisions could be applied to the property you're discussing. And if they could, then I think adding the word hostile to the definition of short-term rental will get us part of the way there. Okay. The problem is the same issue that came up earlier about someone who is currently operating when there was no prohibition or no, no regulation of short-term rentals. So we could not immediately enforce against an existing short-term rental. However, I would think that um, this matter might be investigated by our code enforcement officer to determine if the property in question was in compliance with all our other codes. Mr. Paul, I'd like uh, Mr. Zamarone to elaborate. I think he has familiarity with that property. Uh, yes, sir, if I may, thank you. Uh, there are a few comments that would probably address your concerns. Uh, first and foremost, I understand that you're saying that there isn't a specific prohibition for that term in the code, but there are specific prohibitions for use of areas and, and houses having to do with international code as we've adopted it. And the International Building Code, International Property uh, Maintenance Code does discuss square footage per occupant of a bedroom. So if the code officer, or myself as a code supervisor, had a probable cause to be able to um, retain a search warrant through an affidavit for probable cause to go into the facility, let's say for instance, an EMS call has identified several people at one time in, in a particular room that can become a violation of international code. And that's kind of how we would, it would be a catch all for a, a hotel or a hostel by any other definition. And it'll also address what uh, Mr. Schnall was saying that if things are grandfathered in, it would be difficult to enforce. Well, it already is enforceable. And we are actually already have enforced it on a, an illegal group home that was occupied in, in particular bedrooms by far too many occupants than the uh, international building code allowed. So having said that, uh, there, there is a mechanism, but I'd also like to throw a little caveat out there too, if I may, and that is if, if a room is occupied and it is observed by an impartial third party observer, the police or fire EMS, for instance, that it is occupied at a time, say for instance, four or five times in a 10 by 10 room, then and they can articulate that in a report, then it is a clear violation and we can act on that. But if we're given some piece of information that rises to a level to allow us to get a search warrant and that's kind of etherical in the first place and we go in there and we don't see it occupied then the argument actually becomes and Mr. Snell can probably shed a lot more light on this scenario it becomes a situation where a, a homeowner can have as many bunks as they want in an unoccupied room and it becomes a violation when it's occupied so you have to catch that moment in time when it's occupied above the maximum uh, occupancy uh, for a resident, we're not even talking about definition of hostel or hotel uh, as per international building code. So we do have a fast set. Okay, and so I, I appreciate that, Mr. Zamarone. Uh, because the agenda does not permit a broad discussion other than of the new zoning ordinance, um, it is appropriate for the, the question raised by Mr. Paul to be answered, but it is not appropriate for it to be discussed at this meeting. Um, I would suggest, Mr. Paul, that you um, follow up uh, with Mr. Zamarone and Mr. Rampley, and that if that follow-up uh, indicates that this is something to bring back to the council, um, Mr. Rampley can put it on the agenda for the um, July 14 council meeting. Um, but um, I think the, the, the short answer right now, you know, I think is that we add the word hostile to the definition of a short-term rental okay. and, and start with that change um, to perhaps dissuade or preclude 
another one of these kinds of uses um, at a different location. Thank you, Mr. Snow. I have one more quick one. Is it germane? Because we don't want we want to stay within the confines of the agenda. It, it has to do with the zoning thing here. Yes, sir. Page nineteen. I've had a couple of people call me, two, I said a couple, not people, uh, with reference to the um, um, recreation of vehicles, the storage, et cetera. And the question I have is some people in the city, I know because I've seen them, have class A motorhomes. And to me, it seems like as long as that motor home, whether it be 20 feet, 18 feet, 25 feet, fits the other parameters about being hidden, being behind, et cetera, I don't know that we need to put dimensions on the motor home or the recreational vehicle. That's basically my question, because there are some places in the city that have all the room in the world that they can park their recreational vehicle, no matter how big it is, and but as long as it meets the other parameters about being parked behind a fence, being this, being that, I don't know why the 20 feet is a limit, 22, 25, 18. So those are my comments. Mr. Snow might be able to help me with that. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, the only help I can provide is sort of apparent on the page. Um, it's the existing ordinance. It's been that way since 1995. And the review committee and the zoning commission didn't recommend a change. Um, hearing your comment though, um, uh, again, uh, unless there's some objection from a member of the governing body, um, we can um, incorporate that revision into this document um, along with the other three or four things we've talked about this evening and recirculate it to the governing body, get it on the website for people to see and comment on if they want, um, have a public hearing um, either at a special meeting or at the regular meeting in July um, and move forward. Um, it just, it just wasn't something that caught the attention of the review, review committee or the zoning commission. Right, well, as I said, I do not own one, do not plan on owning one, so it's not a personal situation, but it was brought up. And it makes sense as long as that item, that recreation vehicle is hidden behind the fence and there, like I said, I don't, to me the dimensions don't matter, but that's just me. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Um, okay, uh, with that being said, we will proceed to announcements of mayor and council members. Uh, we'll give Mr. Isban a little bit of time. We'll start with Mr. Gregory. Mr. Joyce. I have none this evening. Mr. May. I just want to thank all of those within the city uh, governments, uh, city manager, chief of police, that were so helpful in being responsive to a private citizen here in Castle Hills that wanted to sponsor a Black Lives Matter march. I think it's an important uh, statement that we have people in this community that care about social justice. I wanna commend the police department for being so professional in keeping the marchers and everyone else involved very safe. Uh, I have had many comments uh, from outside of Castle Hills that are positive. This is an image of a community that is welcoming and I think we need to recognize that. Secondly, I've heard many comments from citizens who are happy with our uh, police force and the professionalism, want, to, want that to continue. So uh, I wanna work going forward with the police department and being sensitive to the very issues that brought uh, the Black Lives Matter to our doorstep. Thank you, Mr. May, Mr. Paul. Mr. Isbrand. 
Um, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. I didn't have the opportunity to make comments as you went through the uh, uh, presentation on the zoning ordinance. I wanted to use this opportunity to say um, just very briefly that although Mr. Schnell commented that he was able to present the entire body of work and the review of it in about 45 minutes, which uh, many thumbs up for your ability to do that, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out the work that Mr. Schnell's review committee invested in a, about a year's worth of time, I believe it was, in going line by line, item by item through the ordinance that you have before you tonight. It was a tremendous undertaking, and I think that the members of the review committee deserve uh, particular recognition for that. I'd also like to recognize the members of the Zoning Commission, particularly those that served up until 2019 that invested about two years worth of time in working with the Review Committee and Mr. Schnall to again go line by line through that to try to present to you tonight as comprehensive and thorough a uh, revision of this ordinance as possible. And specifically, I would uh, recognize the commissioners who were serving at that time, Tom Aiken, Jana Baker, Scott Gray, and Mike Flynn, who contributed greatly to this effort. So to everybody who was involved with it, um, I commend you and I, I thank you all for your commitment to it again, in particular to Mr. Schnall. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Esbrin. Uh, with that being said, I just wanted to thank, Thank everybody for uh, being here with us. I encourage you all to uh, wear your mask when you cannot social distance, social distance, wash your hands. Uh, it's my understanding that the hospital stress rate is elevated right now. So we wanna do what we can to help with that. Uh, we should be releasing information in the near future about a mobile testing site in the city of Castle Hills that uh, Metro Health is working with us on and hopefully make that a little bit easier for everybody to get tested. And uh, I think that's it. Mr. Rapley has some comments. Uh, thank you, Mayor. It, it, specifically on this chapter 50, the zoning, I think the idea, um, what Mr. Schnell and I talked about was obviously to go through this PowerPoint. And if we needed another meeting to kind of dive further into short-term rental, home occupation, or any other matters that we can, it'll be council's wish if you'd like to have another meeting, or we can just put this on the July 14th to incorporate the input from today and answer any other questions related to chapter 50 at that meeting as well. But I will send out an email asking if the interest is there from council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rapley. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. A motion by Mr. May, second by Mr. Joyce. All in favor? Meeting adjourned. Everybody have a good evening. Thank you, Mr. Snow. Mr. Esbrand. Thank you.